We're recording.
You may be seated. Do what? Be a day of fasting, right? <laughs> I mean, you're allowed to eat lunch, just oh. not here. <laughs> but then, Thank you. Or if you going to bring it, I don't care. <laughs> but then April 26th, we will have, 23rd, we will have lunch. We'll have lunch on April 23rd. And it's a five-Sunday month, so that'll like set us up nicely to go back to the first third Sunday routine in May. So note to those Sundays, participate if you're able. We, we love our public lunches. They are wonderful things. Any other announcements before I move to the prayer or praise time? Uh, okay, well, let's talk prayers and praise. Is Diana and Molly backstage? Like, yeah. Yay! Yeah. Welcome back. Glad to see your faces. And and pro tip if, you're, if your RV makes a weird noise, please stop and investigate. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's some story time for later. <laughs> Uh, we're very glad that you're here in one piece, yeah, then. That, that was the only scary thing. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. It was 85 degrees and sunshine. Oh. And we went on a lazy river thing, like <laughs> chewing in the water. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard to come home. I bet. Yeah. We, we did miss you all. 50 degree weather. We did miss you all. We missed you. Did we're not have a what else can we be praying for or celebrating? Yeah. Crystal. Crystal, yeah, she was supposed to be here today. Let's... Well, she was hospitalized recently, oh, no. and so... Like, since last week recently? I'm not sure if it happened this week or the week before, okay. but she was in the hospital, and her husband uh, did not want her to be alone, mm -hmm. so he took her to work with him this morning. Okay. So, she is having some rather serious... 
So if we could keep her in our prayers. Yep. Absolutely. Honey? Um, a couple that's been visiting our church recently, Matt and Marilyn. Marilyn volunteers with the Red Cross, and she's been in California for the last couple weeks um, helping with the flood people victims, and um, she is due to fly back tomorrow. God, we're so grateful that Diane and Raleigh had the opportunity to travel and to enjoy warmer weather and calmer paces, but we're so thankful that you've brought them back to us in one piece. Um, thank you for that gift of being able to explore the world that you created, and thank you too for the safety and protection that you have given them. We pray though for Crystal, who just battles so much with her own body, we ask that you would be present with her today. I know that she loves being here, and to not be here is hard for her. So I ask that you would be very much with her, that she would know that you are near, that you are with her in her pain and in her frustrations, and you are with her <coughs> in her process of healing, and that you see her and know her and love her and are on her side. We pray to you for Marilyn, who um, currently is in California helping with the flood victims who are dealing with just so much loss and destruction. Give her strength and compassion and the capacity to meet these folks where they're at and meet the needs that she's able to, but also bring her home safely as she travels tomorrow. Um, protect her in that travel and return her to to us and to Virginia safely. We pray for the folks in California, um, not just from the flooding, but also the extreme snow. Um, and we pray for all of these things that are happening around the world with Turkey dealing with earthquakes and flooding as well, in Syria and in places that we just aren't even aware of because there's so much. God, you are the one who holds this world in your hands. And we are finite. We only can do so much, but you are infinite. So we ask that you would show up in these places, in the places where people are grieving and struggling, where they're exhausted and worn down, where they are confused and mourning, and they would find you and find peace in you. God, as we worship today, be with us in this and help us to connect ourselves more deeply to you, even now. Amen. Amen. Now you just up here. Oh, sure. I'll take the kids and go for kids here. Oh, okay. thank you. Is she on her way? Supposedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> service handout to the scripture reading for the sermon, we'll be looking at the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. This is part of a letter that the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' original disciples, maybe the best known one, wrote to a group of small, new, somewhat struggling churches that are or were located in what is now the country of Turkey. And they were spread out over a vast territory, almost the size of the state of California. And they were little <coughs> islands, little tiny communities meeting in just houses and rented spaces um, in the midst of a vast, uh, diverse place full of uh, 
Romans and all kinds of groups, uh, all kinds of religions, languages, and uh, they were uh, in need of encouragement and instruction. So he wrote to this group of churches this letter that would be passed around, uh, brought by messengers to each church so that they could be encouraged and instructed and challenged through this letter. Um, so this is the Sunday in Lent when we talk about uh, the church. So um, sometimes Lent can tend to be a focus on just the individual. You know, we talked about repenting from sin and things like that. And there is plenty of room for that, you know, our individual spiritual um, walk, our individual spiritual growth. But uh, we are also um, existing in community. And the New Testament tends to, well, actually the Old Testament tends to talk about that a lot. They talk about the individual. We exist as individuals. But we also exist as part of a people, a community that God is forming. So, Peter writes this to this struggling little scrappy bunch of churches. He says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. The old uh, King James translation used to say a peculiar people, meaning that you're peculiar to God, but then the meaning of that word changed a little bit. And Christians are still peculiar, but it, it's God's <laughs> special possession of people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and may glorify God on the day that he visits us. They say that alliteration helps people to remember things, so we're going to try that. We're going to go with www. It's easy because it's like the beginning of an internet address. You don't have to type that in anymore, but when I was but a young person and we had to type in the address, you had to type in www and then the address. So, uh, www, the three W words that I would like you to remember are weirdos, warriors, and windows. Weirdos, warriors, and windows. And we'll explain each of those in turn. First, weirdos. So, um, Peter writes to these people and he says, you were all these different races and ethnic groups and social classes and religions, but now God is forming you into a new people. Um, some of the old uh, pagan writers, when they first met Christians in the early Roman Empire, said that they were like a new race of people, a new nationality, because they, were, they had their own different customs. And he says... You are this group that God is making into, he uses all these uh, big phrases. He says, a holy priesthood, a, a, um, a, a royal priesthood, so a group that is serving the king and that all have free access to God. It's not just special priests anymore, it's the whole group. A group that's been called out of darkness into light. But he also calls them uh, foreigners and exiles, or um, some of the translations you might see, strangers and sojourners, or um, resident aliens is one of the ways to translate that, that um, word. He says, you, the good news is you're this new people of God, but the bad news is you're never going to fully quite fit in anywhere ever again. You're always going to be, or you should be, a little bit weird. Now, you know that every place and every community and every country and every ethnicity has their own customs and ways of doing things. And it's so much so that you don't really even think about it until you encounter somebody who does it differently. And you're like, well, that's weird because that's obviously not the way you do it. I mean, on a micro scale, maybe it's if you're in a family and you just think, well, everybody does Christmas this way. 
and you know you do this on Christmas Eve and then you always eat this food and then you do you know you open the presents on Christmas morning or you have a tree or whatever and then you go over to somebody else's house or you marry into a family or you, you visit somebody and they do Christmas the wrong way <laughs> it's not different it's wrong and then you can man uh, multiply that so much more by by countries so um, four years ago uh, Mel and I got the chance to, to live and work for a while in Spain and it was wonderful we were all excited about it and the first week that they were that we were there we heard about this uh, this restaurant down the street that was supposed to have really good food so we thought uh, we're gonna go have dinner so I, I looked them up online and it said they opened for dinner um, at 8 30 p.m. <laughs> And to be honest, that's when I'm starting to get ready for bed. But we thought, okay, you know, 8.30, fine, you know. It's Europe. We're, you know, it's very cosmopolitan. We'll, 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 we'll show up. So we showed up at 8.29, and it was dark. And it did not look like it was open at all. So we stood outside the door. I started knocking on the door, and nobody. We waited about 8.35, very just putting on his uniform, a very grumpy looking man came and sort of looked at us like, I mean, I guess we're technically open. So he opened up and put some stuff on a table and brought us to a table by about 8.45, we were seated and Mel and I were both about to fall asleep. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll come back in 15 or so minutes and see if you've looked at the appetizer menu or whatever. And he came back. So we had a great meal. I don't remember any of it, but it was a great meal. And about 10 o'clock, we were leaving, and that's when people were starting to trickle in, um, because that was just the custom there, that they eat, uh, for a whole variety of cultural reasons, they eat dinner incredibly late in Spain. Um, and some of that goes way, way back in the culture, and then some of it we later found out, um, it's because Franco, the dictator for a long time there, was buddies with Hitler and looked up to him. So he changed the time zone in Spain to line up with the German time zone, even though Spain is considerably west of Germany. And so it doesn't match up with the sun. And it's been like 40 some years since Franco was gone, but they never quite managed to change it back. So everybody's uh, rhythms are all off. And everybody's really tired in the morning, but they still have dinner at like 10 or 11. And the early bird special, I think, starts at 10.15. And it felt, it was just one of those things we didn't even think of. But you would encounter that again and again. Little things that were different, that made us stick out. Even if we spoke a little bit of the language, there was always something that, you, that made you not quite fit in. And Peter says in this letter, um, you are in this new community, and so you are going to be like, resident aliens wherever you go because you are connected to the world that God is making. The, not, just, not just some different place out there and out there, but the world that God is building, the kingdom of God. And you are in, playing in tune with that, and it's a tune that's different from the way the world is now. Everything's out of joint because we're supposed to be trying to do things in line with this vision that we see of where God wants the world to be. Um, and then that clashes with the way the world is. And so he says, you're going to be weird. And if you completely and utterly fit in wherever you go, maybe you're not weird enough. <laughs> so Jesus says, in another place, Jesus says, if all people always speak well of you, then you are not uh, doing something right. Because um, the, the way the world is, the way the, uh, the current system is, is not going to fit with where you are supposed to be. The values that you live by are going to be a little different. The values that you live by aren't going to be the values of um, the ads that get thrown at you or the values of the political parties that fight over you, or uh, the values of um, the people who are, are supposed to be thinking about like what, what humankind should be going towards, or what we should look like, or what progress means, won't look the same to you. Now that's, that's hard to hear sometimes, because I like where I am. I like this county. 
Um, I've only lived here for not quite 16 years, so I think that still makes me a newcomer. Um, but I love it. You know, I love the land and the people and the place and the customs, the ones that I've learned. Um, and there is this tension for Christians that we, do, we don't hate the place where we are. We love the place where we're from or where God has placed us. We work for its good. As it says in Jeremiah, we seek the good of the city where God has placed us. And yet, we never quite fit in with the aspects of it that are different from how God wants it to be. Um, the, the greed, the racism, whatever it might be in your community. Um, the Christian uh, songwriter, Rich Mullins, we've sung some of his songs in church. There's one um, that he wrote a song about this tension, and it's called The Land of My Sojourn. And he sings a song about America and how, how he loves wandering this country and living in this country, but he never quite feels connected to some of the priorities and the values of its culture. And he, he says, nobody tells you on the day you get born here how much you'll come to love it and how you'll never belong here. So I'll call you my country. I love it. But I'll be lonely for my home. I wish that I could take you there with me, he says. And, and that, I think, really captures the way that Christians are, end up feeling. We feel a little weird, a little disconnected, a little bit like strangers and sojourners. And so when we find ourselves fitting in too much, um, that's sometimes a, a chance to check ourselves and be like, well, um, but yeah, it's, so it's an encouragement that if you look a little weird, um, that's not the end of the world because people always look weird when they're not from there and they don't, they don't practice the same customs. But of course, the challenge is to look weird for the right reasons, right? It doesn't mean that we're supposed to look weird because we're, you know, handling snakes or believing dumb things or, or you know, whatever it is. Um, we're supposed to look weird because we're living by the values of, that are in this, in this scripture in God's word and, and brought by Jesus. So that's the weirdest part. Second, warriors. So he says, dear friends, I encourage you, now that you're foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which are waging war against your soul. So he had to remind them and us, because it's easy to forget, that we are actually in a war. On December 7th, 1941, the American personnel at uh, the naval base at Pearl Harbor did not know that they were in a war. And they were doing their Sunday morning thing, as usual. Some of them were on shore, taking the day off. Some of them were uh, just taking a lazy, slow Sunday morning. Because it's peacetime, right? The band was practicing. I think there was going to be a, a chapel service. Uh, people were, you know, fixing their uniforms and stuff. But you weren't—they weren't super vigilant because they weren't at war. But the Japanese Navy that was on its way there with its carrier planes, the men in those planes knew that there was a war going on. They were just a few hours ahead of the news, basically. And uh, the Americans were caught completely by surprise because they were assuming that it was a clear blue sky and it was a lovely day in Hawaii and that it was peace. And so even when they saw things that weren't quite right or they, they saw some stuff on the radar or they heard that there were people coming, they ignored it and they explained it away. One side knew there was a war going on and the other didn't and it ended in, in bloody disaster for the Americans. Peter says, you are at war, not with people, that's important. Like as Paul says, we're not fighting a war against flesh and blood people. But he says you're at war with sinful desires. And some of you don't even know it. They are waging war against your soul. He wants to heighten the level of seriousness with which we take sin. So this is the part that sounds kind of lentish. He says there are sinful desires and cravings that are actually out to kill you. Your soul, the, the, the part of you, it's not just that it's the spirit and everything else is your body, it doesn't matter, it's not like that. It's, it's the inner life that you have, the part that is, that is directed and present to 
towards everything else. Uh, the part that, that rules your life, the soul. And there are things that are out to corrode and kill your soul. Now, the old translation said uh, fleshly lusts. Um, but again, sometimes that's unhelpful because lusts, now we tend to think of that only as sexual temptations. And it can be that. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which the sex desire and drive can go astray and take us into bad places. But it means lusts like desires or cravings or what the old Christian writers used to call the passions, right? So it could be a desire for comfort and having things go easy that leads you into laziness. It could be a desire to be admired, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can take you into uh, putting up a false front of who you are and lying about what you do and who you appear, make yourself appear to be so that people will like you. It can be a desire for power that means you have to control other people's lives and make them treat you a certain way, make your employees or your kids or your friends or your family members treat you a certain way. It can be a desire for safety that leads to a paranoia, desire for revenge, a fear that sees danger in every kind of person or group that's different from you. It's these cravings that will kill you. And Peter says, I'm your friend. He says, dear friends, I need to warn you that you are polishing the brass on a ship that you think is a ship at peace. And there are people coming towards you that are bent on war. <laughs> Except in this case, they are coming from inside of you. They are your desires out of control. And you need to wage war against them. So, a couple of things on that. If we begin to take these desires seriously enough that we wage <clears throat> war against them, the first thing, and I hope this is encouraging, is uh, sin gets a lot tougher once you actually resist it. Um, it can feel easy to go along sort of the spiritual life if you're saying yes to everything you want to do or anything that the, the external society is pushing you to do. Once you actually start saying no to things, it can start feeling really hard when you're not going along with the crowd, when you're not doing what everybody wants you to do. It actually starts to feel tough because that's what resistance and conflict feels like. Secondly, if you're in a war, it behooves us, I have used the word behoove in the sermon in a while, it benefits us to know our enemy. There are some of us and I include myself in this, who fall into the same exact sins and patterns over and over again, and we think, well, now how did that happen? There's a, there's a sitcom with very dark humor set in the British trenches in World War I, and the general says, I've got a brilliant new plan. We're going to get out of our trenches, and we're going to walk slowly in broad daylight toward the enemy. We've tried it 16 times in a row, and it's never worked. But they'll never think that we'd be dumb enough to try it 17 times in a row, so we'll catch them by surprise. I think, you know, we laugh at that, but I think some of us are like that. We think, now, how did, how did I fall into that same pit again? It's because we haven't paid attention to the enemy, to the tricks and traps and patterns that we have set for ourselves or something has set for us. So if you, I mean, it can be simple. It can be just eat a snack. If you find yourself always getting into a horrible mood and a horrible fight with your family at 5.30 p.m., maybe it's because of the way that your day is built or you're tired or you're cranky or you're stressed or, you know, you're hungry or you had too much caffeine or not enough. It can be little things like that, but it can also be, um, are you in the company of people who always pull you into talking or thinking or hating or loving in a certain way? It can mean distancing yourself from groups that draw you into conflict. It can mean not following that person on social media or not reading that thing. If you're really just reading it, it's called hate following. <laughs> it's like you're just reading it because you know that they're going to make you mad. And they're whipping you up either because you're mad at them or because they're always pointing out things to be horrified and terrified about and whipping you up into a frenzy. Know that. Learn that about yourself and admit that you're kind of silly and you're trying it the 17th time in a row. You're not going to win. Just don't do it. 
And then finally on this section, get to know the weapons that you have. You have the Spirit of God in you. You have the wisdom of the scriptures that warn you about these things. You have friends who you can talk to. And you know that friend that's not going to let you out of stuff. The friend who's going to say, well, how's it really going though? And I don't believe you and things like that. You need a friend like that who can kind of pin you down a little bit and say, well, but how, how are you really doing? And then finally, so you've been weirdos and warriors, and then finally, windows. So some of you have had the chance to uh, see places with beautiful stained glass, be it uh, little bits of stained glass here or massive windows, such as in some of the bigger churches or cathedrals, maybe in some of the big cities, um, or in museums sometimes where they've got whole walls and windows made out of stained glass. The window is colored in such a way that it makes the light that comes through it even more beautiful, not only to your eye, but also in the patterns that it casts on the wall or on the floor. And it turns ordinary light that you ordinarily only see as nothing or white into this brilliance of color. Peter reminds us that we are on display, that we are windows through which people see something about God. He says, verse 12, he says, live such good lives among the pagans that even though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good deeds and will glorify God on the day he visits us. If this sounds familiar, it's because Peter is echoing his teacher, Jesus, who said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good deeds and glorify God, right? That we are to be not gunked up, <laughs> uh, smudged up windows covered with green algae that, you, that the only thing people see when they look at it is, gosh, that needs a cleaning. But we are windows, each of us different, each of us made in a particular way with a particular personality and gifts that can show something about God. If you back up to um, the second half of verse 9, the reason that God calls us is to show or declare in word and action the praises or the excellencies of God who called us. We are God's workmanship that he is displaying to the world. So this means a couple of things. First, it means that we're not the Amish. There's a lot of things to admire about the Amish or some of these groups that are like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be over there. there are, there's a lot to admire about those groups, but that's not necessarily our calling. We are to live among and in front of people who are not believers in Christ. Peter expects that his listeners will have people in their lives, people that they deal with, people that they know, people that they love, who are not believers who will know them enough that they can see them. Secondly, I don't think it just means your good deeds either. I think it also means your struggles. When, when Christians get the reputation of being what's called toxically positive, where they say, it's going great, even when it's not, I think people realize that that's fake and it's not human. But if you let people see that you hold on to God even during hard times and struggles. That means something deep because everybody goes through hard times and they'll see how you're dealing with it. We're not to live this way. We're not to live good lives so that people will be impressed with us, but so that people will see the light that comes through us and glorify God. Um, we have to admit that as the church, so I'm talking collectively now, we have often not been known for this. That many of the things that Christians are known for is for shooting our mouth off about stuff we don't really know about or, um, you know, trying to pass really heavy-handed laws or for being mean about things or getting into fights or fighting, squabbling with each other. But there's, I know that there's a lot because I've seen it of quiet good deeds going on. And I think people do see that as well. And that is what we want the church to be known for. So that accusations against us will show will be shown to be false. We don't want to be uh, 
truly accused, but he says people will say all kinds of false things about you, but if you are living a good life in front of the pagans, he says something amazing. He says, they will come to join you. They will come to glorify God on the day that he visits us. In Revelation, when John sees the number, he sees the, the crowd of people praising God and, and feasting together at the wedding feast, he says it's so high, no one could count that high from every race and nation and tribe and tongue. The people who see you and who see your light, and it doesn't need to be some spectacular, amazing rock star life. It could just be a quiet life of good deeds. May come to be people who glorify God, even though before they thought God was just a swear word. There are some of you also who have had people say false things against you, and maybe they're still saying it somewhere about you. And you're having to bear up under that. Uh, friends or coworkers or even family who have this whole false narrative that they say about you. And if you keep on plugging away, there will come a day when the truth will be known and the accusations will be shown to be false. God has called us to be part of the same <laughs> weird little group that started with these churches scattered all over Turkey and Greece and the Mediterranean, and now has come all the way down to us. We're weird too. We're weird in a different way, but I hope that we stick out for good reasons among this world and this culture, that we come to be known as people who are walking in good lives among um, a people who need to see genuine goodness, who've seen a lot of fakes, and they need to see genuine goodness. We can do this only because we have been called into God's light, not because we're so awesome. So let's pray for God's grace to help us this season. God, we thank you for this letter and these little tiny churches. We thank you for Peter, who in his own life showed what it meant to be called out of his old life and into something new, uh, a new exciting adventure following Jesus. We pray that you would give us strength for the fight as we fight against desires and impulses that would pull us away from the light and pull us toward the death of our own souls. Give us the strength and wisdom to fight those things together, not just as isolated individuals. And we ask that the things that we do, even when we fall down and you have to pick us up again, would be seen by others and that we would have a reputation as people who are walking towards you and not as evildoers. In Christ's name, amen.
responsibly from the New Testament scriptures about our new life. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, although for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Therefore, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitudes of your minds. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, in Christ, God forgave you. Be the imitators of God, bearing the Lord, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Please stand and sing with us. Oh, 
God our Father, we pray for the church here and around the world, fill it with all truth, and in all truth with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it has gone wrong, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. You sort of have to stand up for this next song because I don't so Let's stand as a true church for a so easy to 